<clears throat> Welcome you all. Uh, this is the 17th talk uh, of astrophysical talk series organized by Istanbul University Observatory. And today our speaker is Manu Linares from uh, Norwegian University of Science and Technology. Uh, <clears throat> After he finished his PhD degree in the University of Amsterdam, Amsterdam he worked uh, in MIT first and then Institute of uh, Astrophysical Institute of Canarias in Tenerife. He worked in Barcelona first as Marie Curie Fellow and then uh, Associate Professor. And now, as I said, uh, he's a professor in uh, Norwegian uh, University of Science and Technology. He's Interests are compact objects, uh, accretion flows, and high energy astrophysics. And today he will give a talk titled uh, Pulsar Winds and Accretion Flows in Compact Binary Millisecond Pulsars. Uh, Manuel, we thank you for accepting our offer to give a talk here, and we are uh, very happy to uh, listen to your talk. So, this is your turn. You can uh, start sharing your screen and you can start. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let me find the screen share here. There we go. All right, so you can see again my, my slides. And you can hear me well? Yes, yes, we hear you well and uh, we also see your slides. All right, thank you very much, Jan and, and Tukba and Tolga also for, for the kind invitation to give this talk and, and thank you for, for the introduction. So today I will tell you a story about compact binary millisecond pulsars. And so quite a lot has changed since the last time I was in, in Istanbul talking about this topic. So for instance, we give these seminars now online. Uh, so these I checked and this was October, 2013. Uh, last time I was talking about this in, in Istanbul. So a lot has changed in the, uh, in the world, in the outside world, but also a lot has changed in, uh, uh, in the field of binary millisecond pulsars. And so today I will try to give you a broad and, and updated uh, view of this exciting and rapidly evolving field of compact binary millisecond pulsars. And first, before I start, I want to thank my, my group and my collaborators, you know, some, some of them listed here because it's a real, real privilege to work with them. So um, shout out to, to all of these. So the, the, this story has three chapters and the plan of the talk is very simple. So I will first introduce you to spiders. Uh, to compact binary millisecond pulsars that are also known uh, as spiders. And then in the first part, I will talk about subluminous accretion. In the second chapter, second part of this talk, I will, uh, I will tell you about pulsar winds and shocks. And then in the third part of the talk, I will tell you about supermassive neutron stars, which are also connected with this type of millisecond pulsar. So let's get started. What are spiders? What are compact binary millisecond pulsars? Well, of course, you need first a millisecond pulsar, rapidly rotating neutron star. Um, and here in this cartoon on the right, that's, uh, that's represented by, by this. Uh, and the millisecond pulsar typically dominates the gamma ray and the radio emission. So down in this panel, you see a spectral energy distribution versus frequency from the optical X-ray all the way to gamma rays in, in Fermi LAD. So the pulsar dominates here uh, in the LAD band uh, typically, and, and also in the radio band, even if it's not shown in this spectral energy distribution. Um, so then you also need a companion. You, these systems are binary systems. So there's a, a, a non-degenerate or a semi-degenerate companion star that is um, in orbit uh, together with this millisecond pulsar. And the mass of this companion star is what determines what type of uh, spider we're talking about. So for masses 
of about 0.1 solar masses of the order of 0.1 solar masses, these systems are called redbacks. Um, and if the companion mass is 10 times lower, uh, about a hundredth of a solar mass, these are called black widows, black widow pulsars. So these spider names were inspired by a, a possible cannibalistic um, effect of the millisecond pulsar on the companion star. And since these, these are black widows and redbacks are spiders that eat their companions after mating. So that's what inspired these, these nicknames, uh, which have stuck uh, in the community since, uh, since these systems were first discovered. Then these two stars, the millisecond pulsar and the companion are in a tight orbit, in a compact orbit. That means orbital periods of about one day or, or shorter. And as a consequence of this tight orbit, there is an, a shock, an intrabinary shock between the wind of the companion and the wind of the pulsar. And this shock is what you have depicted here uh, on this slide. And this shock is thought to dominate the X-ray band. So these X-rays are mostly coming from this intrabinary shock. And of course, uh, I haven't mentioned, but the optical band is dominated by the companion star. So that's why you have here these three parts of the binary system dominating at different wavelengths. Why are they interesting spiders? Well, for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, from, for, from an evolution point of view, from a binary evolution point of view, they provide a, a clear direct link with other types of binaries uh, that we see in our galaxy that are called low mass X-ray binaries. So these uh, spiders, these compact binary millisecond pulsars are thought to be evolutionary descendants of low mass X-ray binaries. Um, so they provide a link with those because they have been low mass X-ray binaries for a long time, for uh, uh, giga years, they have accreted, the neutron star, the pulsar has accreted mass um, from the companion. And that means that the, the neutron stars are uh, expected to have a higher mass than with respect to the initial mass they had when they were born. So they have this accreting past, this accreting history, they've increased their mass and therefore they're also interesting to study what is the maximum mass of a neutron star. Uh, and that's the, the third chapter of this, of this story. This intrabinary shock that I already introduced makes them also interesting from a particle acceleration point of view and from a cosmic ray point of view. So that's also something that uh, makes these systems interesting. Um, and I will discuss that during the talk. And then some of them, a few of them are transitional millisecond pulsars and they show transition between different states that I will explain, but then they give us really the opportunity to study the interaction between the neutron star, the pulsar wind and the neutron star magnetosphere with an accretion flow around it. So that's what this disk wind magnetosphere interaction means. There's, there's also uh, new opportunities by these transitional millisecond pulsars uh, to study the closest vicinity to the neutron star uh, magnetosphere, as you will see. So this field has seen really a true revolution in the last decade. And this was, these are, this is an all sky map in galactic coordinates, latitude, galactic latitude and longitude. And this shows the four spiders that we knew in 2008 in the galactic field before Fermilat was launched. We knew only four of them and they were a small fraction of the total millisecond pulsar population, about 5%. Now, more than a decade later, we know more than 50 spiders. So this is the, uh, the all sky map updated uh, last year, 2021. Red points here show red backs, black squares here show uh, black widows. And, and also several candidates are shown here in, in empty symbols. So you see now this really is a booming field and a growing population of millisecond pulsars. And in particular, now we're, these represent more than 15% of the total millisecond pulsar population. This has all been thanks 
or this has mostly been thanks to Fermilat. Um, so most of these new spiders discovered have been found by targeting Fermilat gamma ray sources, GV sources that were unidentified uh, initially, but then taking targeted observations of those Fermilat unidentified sources, we have discovered a flurry of new uh, spiders. And these searches have happened so far, mostly avoiding the galactic plane. So these searches have uh, been performed far from the plane, uh, galactic latitudes of more than five or less than minus five degrees to avoid diffuse gamma ray emission in the plane, but also to avoid extinction in the optical and the galactic plane, and also to avoid dispersion in radio uh, when searching for pulsars in the radio band. So for a number of uh, reasons, the galactic plane has been avoided. And you will see why I mentioned this, because later in the talk, this will become apparent. So part of this revolution is also due to the fact that some of these spiders, the redbacks, some of the redbacks have shown state transitions. And here you see an example in the globular cluster M28. This is one of the redbacks in M28, M28i. And here you see a long-term X-ray light curve, and this is X-ray luminosity in the X-axis um, versus time between 2002 and 2020. So you see here different, different values of the X-ray luminosity. Back in 2002, this was uh, low X-ray luminosity. And basically, this defines three different states which you have also labeled in this plot, the pulsar state at the lowest X-ray luminosities, the disk state at intermediate X-ray luminosities, and the outburst state at the highest X-ray luminosities. So also shown in this plot are the, are the radio pulsar detections, these field squares and these field triangles, they show the times when the radio millisecond pulsar was detected. Okay, so so the, the basically you see how there's this, this uh, red bag has transitioned between the pulsar state in 2002 uh, and then it was in the disk state in 2008. And then some, somewhere in around 2010, again in the disk state and then pulsar state. And then in, it went into a full outburst in 2013. And that's when uh, this was discovered as a transitional millisecond pulsar by Papito and collaborators, and then back to the disk state and pulsar state. So there's multiple transitions happening uh, in these systems between these different states. And that is why we call them transitional millisecond pulsars. Um, we also see these in, in another uh, famous transitional millisecond pulsar that you have shown here, uh, pulsar J23 plus 0038. Here you see again a state transition from the pulsar state on the left to the disk state on the right. So these blue symbols show again, X-ray luminosity. And the X-ray luminosity is uh, uh, scaled on the right vertical axis. You see between 10 to 31 and 10 to 34 arcs per second. So you see how the X-ray luminosity increases when we go from this pulsar state to this disk state. But also in red here, you have the LAT, Fermilat, GV uh, flux. So the gamma ray flux also increases when transitioning from the pulsar state into the disk state with a clear and sharp uh, step that you see here. Then why do we call this the disk state? Well, because we have evidence, as I will discuss, that there is an accretion disk in this state. And this evidence comes mostly from the optical emission lines that you see on the right side. So these black arrows show the times of optical spectra, different optical spectra that were taken of the system. And you see how in 2009 in the pulsar state, this showed absorption lines from the companion star. But then in 2014 and 2016, this system showed strong 
broad double peaked emission lines, which tell us that there, there is an accretion disk. Um, so, you know, that's another thing that makes uh, compact binary millisecond pulsars in general and, and, and red bags in particular are very interesting because they can show this transition between different states. And this is something that we studied uh, already back in 2013 and 2014. So now I'm showing again the X-ray luminosity here in the Y axis over more than six orders of magnitude. And, and then the X axis I'm showing the photon index of the X-ray spectrum. So the hardness of this X-ray spectrum. So up here in, in this outburst state, we're reaching luminosities of a, of a few percent Eddington or, or higher. And that is typical of low mass X-ray binaries. So this is a clearly accretion powered state. The source of energy here is gravitational energy of the accreting matter onto the neutron star. On the bottom side of this plot, you see the pulsar state, the red bags in red and black widows in black again. And those are clearly powered by rotational energy, by the loss of kinetic energy of rotation of the pulsar. So that's what this rotation power means. And then in between here, there's this intermediate disk state, which is really new and interesting. And it's at the crossroads between accretion power and rotation power. And this is where the first chapter of this story starts in the disk state or this intermediate or disk state. So why is it interesting? For several reasons, we can study accretion flows at very low luminosities. These are, if you look at this plot again, these are 10 order 10 to the minus five Eddington. Um, so that is subluminous, very low level accretion. We can study how accretion flows behave at these luminosities. We can also study outflows at these very low inferred mass accretion rates. And, and there's some evidence that maybe they're more luminous in radio than, than other types of neutron stars. And we can study pulsar magnetospheres uh, very close to the light cylinder. Um, because that's, as I will argue, that's where we think the accretion flow is uh, uh, truncated. And that's where we think really the, the, the interesting things are happening very close to the light cylinder. So the light cylinder of a, of a neutron star, of a, of a pulsar, for those who don't know the, this topic, is the radial distance, the radius where co-rotating magnetic field lines with the neutron star reach the speed of light. So that's what's defined as the light cylinder. And therefore the fastest, the faster the neutron star spins, the closer to the neutron star this light cylinder is. And then also that separates the regions with closed magnetic field lines with open magnetic field lines. So that's you know, really what, what sets the, the, the size of the magnetosphere of the neutron star. So again, the evidence for uh, Keplerian disks, let's look at this in some more detail. How, are, how do we really know that these are the, there's accretion disks in this intermediate state? Well, you see the same lines that I, emission lines that I mentioned earlier in the disk state broad double peak hydrogen helium emission lines that are typical of accretion. These, these, are, these two peaks are uh, reflecting Keplerian motion in the accretion disk, approaching parts of the disk and receding parts of the disk that are giving these very characteristic profiles to the optical emission lines. And here in this, in this uh, plot you see on the left, you see the absorption uh, lines from the companion in the pulsar state where you see just the orbital motion of the of the companion along the orbit. And then in these middle panels, you see a, the double picked uh, lines with also an absorption line superposed from the companion. And here on the bottom, you, you have a, what's no, called as a Doppler map. So using these, these different optical lines at different orbital phases, we can map the emission where the, this optical emission, where this line emission comes from. And that's what's shown in the bottom panels here. These are Doppler maps and they're giving us this clear uh, evidence uh, and unequivocal evidence for the presence of an accretion disk in this state. 
Okay, and then from the width and the peak separation of these lines, we can also infer and put constraints on the truncation radius of the disk. So in this case, Shabazz et al. Uh, in 2019, put constraints on the outer radius of the disk, R out, to be about 10 to 25 times the inner radius of the disk. So those are then quantitative constraints that we can put on the on the disk from, from these optical lines. And I should say this inner radius of the disk is the inner radius of the disk that emits in H alpha. So this is maybe a bit more technical, but the bottom line is that um, we are confident the disks are there and we can put constraints from the optical lines as well. So when we looked at these systems, these transitional millisecond pulsars in X-rays, um, we found very peculiar behavior back in 2013 uh, in the form of X-ray mode switching. So here in this light curve um, on the left, which is also animated here on, on this right panel, these are images of the center, the core of the globular cluster M28. This is M28i, and you see how it's switching quite rapidly in timescales of hours, even minutes, um, between the, what we call disk active or disk high modes and disk low modes. So there's this X-ray mode switching, which is characteristic and ubiquitous of the transitional millisecond pulsars in this state. That was a new phenomenon when we found this back in 2013. So we also proposed um, a model, to a toy model to explain um, why this is happening. And in our uh, first model, which we call the tug of war, there is a balance, a dynamical balance between the accretion flow and the pulsar wind. So um, the light cylinder for this uh, system is at 186 kilometers. That means that for the height mode, we can infer, we can estimate what's the magnetospheric radius, and that would be inside the light cylinder in the high mode. And then in the low mode, we estimate it to be outside the light cylinder. So we proposed back then this toy model of the accretion disk moving in and out uh, of the light cylinder. Um, and therefore in this, in this uh, interpretation and in this toy model, this up here is mostly accretion powered in the high mode. And this down here is mostly rotation powered in the low mode. So that's this, this uh, dynamic balance or tug of war, if you want. Um, so several years later, uh, Parfrey and Tchaikovsky, they published these simulations that you see here, uh, hopefully you see in the movies, yes, uh, showing GRMHD simulations of an accretion disk around a millisecond pulsar. And this show, um, so this is a density, log of the density in, the, in color scale, and these are radial. So this is a, a box of 80 times 80 gravitational radii uh, in size. Uh, and this vertical line that you see here is the light, the radius of the, shows the radius of the light cylinder. So in these simulations, they found things very similar to this tug of war model that we had proposed uh, several years before. So you see in the middle panel, something reminiscent of the disk state of this uh, dynamic balance where the accretion flow enters the light cylinder and then is pushed out and then back in and out uh, in, in something very similar or very reminiscent of um, this tug of war uh, that I explained. So, of course, this was a while ago, and we know there's X-ray mode switching now in all the transitional millisecond pulsars, and we can also estimate the mass accretion rate, and we, if we assume that this mass accretion proceeds down to somewhere close to the light cylinder, this results into this order of magnitude m dots in grams per second, 10 to the 13, 14, but then what, if you look closely here, these are light curves again of these uh, transitional millisecond pulsars, if you look closely, you see there is also variability intrinsic to these modes. So the disk high mode and the disk low mode, they have intrinsic variability 
beyond the, the switches, beyond the mode switching, right? So what we wanted really to look at here is, can this variability reveal new time skills in the system? Can we uh, find characteristic time skills? Uh, and then we did a systematic study of these um, transitional millisecond pulsars using XMM and Chandra observations. And the results were published earlier this year. And the re main result was a discovery of flat top noise um, in, the, in the power spectrum of this, um, of this state, of the disk high mode. So here you see Fourier power spectra plotted, power versus Fourier frequency. And these are flat uh, up to a certain frequency, and then they break to a, approximately one over F shape above this frequency. This frequency is called the break frequency. Um, and we measure this cover for the first time, this noise, and, and that allows us to measure the break frequencies in these two transitional millisecond pulsars that I already introduced, J1023 and M28i. So this is, uh, again, this flat top noise with a break, and uh, these are the lowest break frequencies. Uh, well, as I will sh uh, show and mention, this is also seen in low mass X-ray binaries, accreting at much higher luminosities. So in this, this state, we're talking about 10 to the minus five Eddington, as I mentioned, but here in the in hard states of low mass X-ray binaries, this is also seen commonly um, at luminosities that are 10 to the minus three, 10 to the minus one Eddington. So uh, several two to four orders of magnitude higher X-ray luminosities. And these are very low and they're different. So you see also that 1023 has a 2.8 millihertz break frequency and, J and M28i has a 0 0.9 millihertz uh, break frequency. So there is also a difference between these transitional millisecond pulsars in, in their break frequencies. They're also stable in the long term. So when we have multiple epochs, you can see that these break frequencies are the same. And that is something remarkable and different from low mass X-ray binaries. So this, this noise is interpreted in low mass X-ray binaries as fluctuations in mass accretion rate in the disk that are propagated inwards. And this, uh, these are superposed in the innermost regions of the accretion disk. And these propagating mass accretion rate fluctuations uh, are, are all added and superposed in, the, in these innermost regions and give rise to this uh, variability that you see in the light curves and in the power spectrum. And um, this long-term stability is different than low mass X-ray binaries because in low mass X-ray binaries, these break frequency is moving all over the place here it's remarkably constant on year, on several year time scales. That, that's why this can be summarized as, you know, new evidence for a faint, stable, and a fluctuating disk. So it is faint at low luminosity, it is stable in year time scales, and it's fluctuating because it shows this uh, X-ray variability typical of low mass X-ray binaries. Here you see again a comparison of, of the transitional millisecond pulsar on the left with low mass X-ray binaries with, for if there's some of you that are familiar with uh, low mass X-ray binaries and accreting millisecond pulsars, the one in the middle is a, an accreting millisecond pulsar with higher break frequencies. And the one on the right side is Aquilex, one also very famous uh, Newton star transient and low mass X-ray binary at higher frequencies and higher luminosities. So we also use these newly discovered frequencies to put constraints on the, on the truncation of this accretion disk. And in particular, uh, the, this magenta band here shows the measured break frequencies in 1023. Here you have log frequency uh, versus log radius. Here's the neutron star, there's the companion. Uh, and this vertical solid line is the light cylinder radius again, uh, that keeps coming back during this talk. And these lines are, viscous frequencies uh, versus radii. So in this propagating fluctuation model, the break frequency that, you, that you, you've seen and that we found is given by the viscous frequency at the inner edge of the disk. So we can use this to 
estimate where is the inner edge of the disk just from the X-ray variability. And we find that this is about between one third and three times the light cylinder radius. So for the range of mass accretion rates that is plausible, uh, these lines intersect here between a third and three times the light cylinder. That also gives us an explanation to why the frequencies are different in these two transitional millisecond pulses. as well. Their light cylinders are, have different sizes. So the light cylinder of J1023 is 81 kilometers is smaller and the light cylinder M28i is larger. That's 186 kilometers, as I mentioned. So we also, um, you know, go a little bit forward and, uh, and beyond these and put together the, the two break frequency measurements for 1023 and M28i. And that together with these estimates and these analytical studies of XE and Alpar, where they looked at the interaction between a pulsar wind and the accretion disk, they found that the maximum stable M dot is about five times 10 to the 14 grams per second. And this is the horizontal line that you see here in this M dot versus viscosity per alpha. Uh, parameter alpha plane. So putting this together, uh, you know, we find that if now we relax the assumptions on the viscosity parameter, it can be somewhere between 0 0.2 and one. And the M dot, the mass accretion rate is in this range between 10 to the 13 and, and a few times 10 to the 14 grams per second. So again, constraints uh, from X-ray timing on, the, on this innermost accretion flow. There is much more to the disk state that I don't have time uh, to tell you about, but here is a little uh, summary. And there is a lot of work by many groups uh, on this. And, and if you're interested, you can then go back to these and check these references. But the bottom line main message is that we can probe this pulsar wind close to the light cylinder. Now, I wanna move to the second uh, chapter and to the uh, bottom side of this uh, of this plot, the lowest X-ray luminosity is this pulsar state where we see most of spiders actually, where uh, we have many more uh, spiders in, in this state. And this, and this state allows us to um, study pulsar winds and intrabinary shocks. So this is interesting for a number of reasons. Um, pair cascade production in millisecond pulsars, particle acceleration in these, uh, in these shocks, in these relativistic shocks, and then to study the companion wind also, whether it's intrinsic or it's driven by irradiation. And then you, we can also probe the pulsar wind at longer, literally longer distances from the neutron star. Um, and the main observational evidence that we have for the presence of this intrabinary shock is, comes from the X-rays. As I mentioned in my introductory slide, the, the intrabinary shock dominates the X-rays and these show orbital modulation. So um, here you see results from my, my student, Eda Burgun, who is also in the audience, hello, and that she just submitted recently to APJ uh, showing orbital modulation in M28i. So here you see count rate versus orbital phase. And, this, and she finds this double peak in, which is centered around the inferior conjunction of the pulsar. So this is interpreted as Doppler boosted synchrotron along the intrabinary shock. Uh, and, and if you're interested in the models, that, those are in Vadia Singh, in this reference, Vadia Singh et al. and, and Van der Meeve et al. And this centering of the X-ray modulation with double peak suggests really like you see in the, in the plot on the bottom that the shock is wrapped around the pulsar. So that the shock is really close to the pulsar and surrounding the pulsar. That's what can give this double peak in X-rays um, at the right orbital phases. And this shock can also accelerate particles and we can also measure and detect particles on earth. For instance, on the International Space Station with the alpha magnetic spectrometer. Um, so this has been measuring uh, positron flux since 2011. And one of the main results and, is that the, the detection and of this positron excess, this here you see the positron flux versus energy. And now we're uh, one to one GV, one TV up here. So, you see this excess of flux of positrons above 30 GVs. This is um, thought to come from local astrophysical sources. 
and not from the usual cosmic ray interactions with the interstellar medium, but from local uh, sources. And since pulsars are good at creating electron positron pairs, they're natural candidates to explain this. And this has been looked at in, in the context of several types of pulsars, but here we wanted to see what is really the contribution of spiders to this positron excess. Um, and then to do that, we first quantified the spatial contribution of spiders in the galaxy. And here you see on the left, X, Y, a top view of the galactic plane showing Istanbul here, and then the galactic center down there. And then these are again, red bags and black widows in red and black. Um, and on the right side, you see the height above the disk in kiloparsecs, the distribution of heights above the disk in kiloparsecs, above or below. Um, so you see this red histogram shows the known spiders, and you see this big um, dip here close to Z0. That uh, reflects the fact that we have not search for spiders close to the galactic plane, as I mentioned in also in one of the introductory slides. So that doesn't mean that the spiders are not there, but of course, when we get close to the plane, we'll expect more and more density of uh, systems, but we just haven't found them yet. So there's many hidden spiders. We measure also this scale height of 0 0.4 kiloparsecs. And then uh, uh, there's, as I mentioned, there's, many more spiders hidden nearby. And then we estimate what the total population of spiders in the galaxy is, about two to 7,000, which uh, we also take into account. Then we also um, build a simple analytical model of the re-acceleration of pairs, uh, but I don't have much time to go into this, but the bottom line is pairs created close to the neutron star surface and in the magnetosphere, which are then injected into this intrabinary shock and they are re-accelerated in the intrabinary shock. So the consequence of this re-acceleration in the shock is that the maximum energy is higher. So this can reach even 10 TVs or, or higher energies. And, um, and there's about 10% of the spin down luminosity of the pulsars that can go be emitted in, in electron positron pairs. So then we do, we take this model and this known uh, and estimated distribution of spiders in the galaxy to see what is the expected diffuse flux on Earth. And the answer depends on whether we use isotropic diffusion. You see on the left, the panel uh, plot with the main results of isotropic diffusion, or if we do anisotropic diffusion, which means uh, taking into account the fact that electrons and positrons are charged particles and they prefer to diffuse along magnetic fields. And there is a, a ordered uh, large scale galactic magnetic field. So uh, positrons diffuse preferentially along those lines. So when we look at this anisotropic diffusion, we find that maybe one new spider discovered nearby about 0.5 kiloparsecs could give a major contribution and even produce a second peak in this positron flux. Okay, and if you're interested on in these details, uh, so this is the, the reference published last year. Now in the third chapter and last chapter of the talk, I wanna tell you about supermassive neutron stars. And that means also focusing on this lower part of the diagram that I already introduced, um, on the pulsar state. Um, so this is also important for neutron star mass measurements. And, and in particular to answer the question, what is the maximum mass that a neutron star can support? This question uh, has uh, many sides and broad impact. Uh, or the answer has a broad impact and the question has many sides. Uh, astronomy on how to measure these masses. Also in astrophysics, there's consequences for supernovae, neutron star birth mass, binary evolution, and just to distinguish black holes and neutron stars. Uh, and then, of course, there is a new and renewed interest due to gravitational waves. And the outcome of a merger of two neutron stars depends also on what is this maximum mass of a neutron star. And finally, last but not least, has also a major impact on nuclear physics, because uh, the maximum mass of a neutron star depends on this uh, composition and interaction between particles in the inner core of the neutron star, where uh, 
there is basically a big question mark. Um, and, but then really the, the pressure that these central parts can provide, the maximum pressure that these central parts can provide is what sets the maximum mass that the Newton star can support. Uh, so it has also interesting consequences there. Um, we measure in masses in spiders uh, and we do this and mostly using Kepler laws, but also with care uh, and with um, in particular taking into account the effects of irradiation. So these companion stars that you see here again are often strongly irradiated. That means that the center of mass in green is different than the center of light in blue here. So if we want to measure the velocity of the center of mass in green, we need to correct for this effect carefully. And we do that. And we did that back in 2016, uh, yeah, 18, um, by observing a new uh, a red back that had evidence for a very massive Newton star. And we pointed the big boy Grand Tecan 10.4 uh, meter uh, optical telescope to measure this velocity of the companion. And then the, what we immediately realized is that, yes, indeed, this companion is strongly irradiated. So here on the left, you see optical spectra of the companion star at different orbital phases. Up here, you see the cold side of the star uh, at phase zero. And down here, you see just two hours later, the hot side of the star at phase 0 0.5. So there's drastic changes in the absorption lines that we see. Um, and these are giving us the temperature contrast between the two sides of the companion star. And then we use these lines. These are hydrogen Balmer, for those of you who are familiar, uh, but just hydrogen uh, Balmer lines dominating the inner hot side uh, of the star. And then magnesium, mostly, and metallic lines dominating the outer or cold side of the companion star. So we can quantify and measure these temperatures from these lines independently. We can then use them to measure the velocities of the two sides of the companion, not just one blind center of light, but just split this and, and measure really the velocities of the outer and inner side of the companion star. And that's important because then it allows us to be confidently determine this K2, this velocity of the center of mass of the companion. So that's what we did uh, back then. And the result was a 2.27 plus minus 0.16 solar mass after modeling also the light curves and the radial velocities all together with the constraints from pulsar timing, final result at 2.3 solar mass Newton star, which was published in 2018 and it got some attention. And this video here again shows a, a summary um, of this of this method and this result, and then recently, just last week in Rome, um, Colin Clark et al. Uh, pr presented new results from gamma ray uh, lab observations of spiders, and they find eclipses in the gamma ray light curves of several of these spiders, including the original black widow. The original Black Widow uh, gamma ray light curve is shown here in this uh, bottom right panel. And you see the full eclipse. From these eclipses, they can constrain the inclination of the system and they can recalculate the neutron star mass for this original Black Widow. And they do that. And this is submitted uh, by their group and, and Clark et al. And they find that this original Black Widow, contrary to previous claims, has a mass of 1.8 solar masses. So that means that really the 2.3 solar mass measurement that we published back in 2018 uh, is the current record. And this is the highest mass measured in any Newton star to date. Um, so in the few minutes that I have left, I want to then discuss the implications of these high masses. Uh, and, and first, the implication for the impact on nuclear physics and, and the implications for the equation of state. So here you see a mass, neutron star mass radius diagram showing um, the tracks that different equation of state, equations of state predict. 
Uh, and these equations of state are the ones that encode these microscopic uh, interactions uh, uh, between and, and the composition uh, in the core of the neutron star. Uh, so there's different predictions and you see that our 2.3 solar mass neutron star mass measurement rules out quite a few of them. So the bottom line is that only a stiff, uh, an equation of state that is stiff enough can support such a massive neutron star. So you need in, enough central pressure at the central densities and hyperons, which is a, a form of exotic matter that has been proposed to exist in the cores of neutron stars, hyperons don't seem to be able to provide that pressure. So that, you know, uh, that would rule out the presence of this in the core. There is some, although some debate in the nuclear uh, physics community in that regard, uh, so that's why I say they don't seem to be able to provide that pressure. Now, the impact on gravitational wave astronomy is, is also pretty clear and, and, and direct because the gravitational wave signal when two neutron stars merge that you see here, but also the remnant, what is left after these two neutron stars merge and the kilonova, the, the electromagnetic emission, they all depend on this maximum mass of a neutron star. They're all sensitive to the equation of state of, of uh, ultra dense matter, and therefore depend also on this uh, maximum mass of a neutron star. Um, and then, as maybe some of you uh, have seen, so there's different options, different possible outcomes when these two neutron stars merge. Uh, prompt collapse to a black hole or a short-lived supermassive neutron star or a long-lived even supermass supermassive neutron star. So uh, the question is still out there uh, on whether uh, these mergers can lead to supermassive neutron stars that are long-lived. Um, in my last slide, I will conclude with the comparison between compact object masses measured with optical and electromagnetic uh, techniques in general, and the new measurements that are coming online thanks to LIGO and Virgo of masses of black holes and neutron stars uh, measured with their, their gravitational wave uh, signals. Um, so there has been, besides the initial double neutron star merger in 2017, there's been two new systems uh, that are particularly interesting for this topic. One of them, GW1904-25, has a total mass before merger of 3.4 uh, solar masses, which is in conflict with the known galactic population of binary uh, of double pulsars. And then these other system also is particularly interesting, this other uh, event, GW1908-14, also particularly interesting in this respect, since it had uh, masses measured for the two uh, compact objects of 23 and 2.6 solar masses. So really this 2.6 solar mass object, uh, as the LIGO and Virgo collaboration pointed out immediately, um, um, is um, could be a neutron star or could be a black hole. And that's... Um, basically, this final question is whether there is a mass gap between neutron stars and black holes, uh, and I'm sure we will hear much more about it when next LIGO uh, Virgo run starts in December, the fourth run in December 2022, and I'm sure this question will uh, keep coming and hopefully during the next decade we'll be able to answer it. So I'll finish here with a summary. Um, with the three parts of the talk, the subluminous accretion and the constraints that we put on, on, this, on the disk at these very low luminosities. Then the second part about pulsar winds and shocks, and, and then the, the uh, possibility of uh, positrons uh, emitted from spiders that I've discussed briefly. And then this last part of supermassive neutron stars, and in particular, the most massive neutron star uh, measured to date of 2.3 solar masses. And I've discussed also briefly the impact on nuclear physics and gravitational wave astronomy. I'll leave it there and leave you with our website of our ERC group in Trondheim, 
Uh, if you are interested in joining us and working on these exciting research topics, keep an eye on, the, on this website because there will be more positions open. Thank you very much and I'll take any questions. Uh, thank you, the Dr. Manuel Linus, for this great talk. If there are any questions or uh, comments? Is there any question? Yeah, Kaye. Go ahead, Kaye. Yeah, I have a quick question. Um, first, very nice talk. I enjoyed it very much. Um, so I, I hope you can hear me. I don't know if it works. Yes, thank you. Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. So you said, I mean, when you, in the first part, you talked about, um, you know, this noise and you have this breaking frequency and you said this can be explained by, um, say, the viscosity at the inner edge. And I, I didn't fully understand why this would lead to this, you know, to this breaking frequency at the same point, or why. Why does this? I mean, you said this is it's an assumption, but I, I, I just didn't see why. If you if that would be correspond to the to the to the viscous time scale, that you would get something like this, such a spectrum. Yeah. So. Um... I think the main, the original references for these uh, models are Lyubarsky in the 90s. And then there's been more work of uh, on these by Phil Utley and then, uh, and then there's also Adam Ingram and Chris Don uh, in the modeling, on the modeling side. Um, so um, it is not, it is not immediately straightforward to, to see, but you can imagine that when you have variability at different frequencies, you will then add all of this variability at, these, at those different frequencies in the accretion disk. And that will all add up in the innermost region where the X-rays are really emitted. Uh, and that means that um, the, the amplitude of this variability will, will uh, show a, a change when you reach this characteristic frequency at the inner edge of this, this viscous frequency at the inner edge of the disk. So I haven't given a, a full complete picture of the modeling, but if, if you're interested in these details, I would uh, refer you to the, especially the Ingram and Don papers in, the, in 2012, I believe, 2011, 12, I think those, those explain this, um, quite well. Okay, thank you very much. Should I jump? Hi, hello, uh, Manu. And uh, I have a very brief question uh, that uh, sort of came to my mind when you were uh, describing things. Um, wh why do the disc basically move in and out? I'm not, well, well, you see the, uh, well, this is the outcome of something. So why is it happening? Uh, it's, it's not like, um, is, is it really like a high state and a low state thing that happens due to changes in the accretion rate or is some sort of an instability thing or nothing like that? Or what's the origin of that moving in and out? That's what I thought of thought. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um... So, but I think the, my, my general answer is this uh, dynamical balance. So there is RAM pressure from the accretion disk uh, and that will, you know, um, that will tend to push uh, things inward. And then there is uh, radiation pressure from the pulsar wind and that will tend to push uh, the accretion flow outwards. So um, the, in, in this picture, uh, this balance is dynamic and it doesn't have to be always at the exact same radius, but this can, this can uh, uh, fluctuate, right? Um, however, the fluctuations are relatively small. So as I mentioned, on the, in the long, on, on long time scales, time scales of years, 
And maybe I can show again this long-term X-ray light curve of the disk state of transitional millisecond pulsar that I showed at the beginning of the talk, if this goes fast enough here. So um, these blue points here show on time scales. this is between 2014, 2018. So on long and year time scales, the X-ray luminosity is still remarkably constant. If you compare with what we see in X-ray binaries, where this luminosity really fluctuates, can fluctuate by orders of magnitude. Um, so that's why to me, it's a dynamical balance in short time scales, but a, but a quite stable disk on the long time scales. I hope this answers, yeah. Is there any question or comments? I think no. So thanks again, Manu, for this great uh, talk. So uh, I can close now the session. See you next Monday, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.